die? Will I be in pain? Who will be around me? Will I have my animals? Will I have my things, my loved ones? And who will decide what care I get or don't get? Um, an EMS paramedic, an intensive care unit nurse, maybe even a physician I've never met. Or will it be me and those that I love? So I, after several years in hospice, I not only heard these same questions from patients and, and families, but I started having those for myself. Uh, it gave me a lot of fear to think about not having any control over my death or how things were going to play out. So today I just want to share a little bit of what has helped me. Um, the first thing I had to do was figure out what I wanted, what my wishes are, what kind of treatment I would want, what choices as far as health care that I would want for myself. Then talking to my family, that was interesting. We had about four or five discussions. And I think the hardest part for me was choosing the best person to carry out my wishes. So um, that's exactly what advanced care planning is. It's about doing what you can do now to ensure that the healthcare treatment you receive is consistent with your wishes, your preferences. If you find yourself in a position where you can't be your own healthcare advocate, Excuse me, this is my first Zoom video. And so I'm just kind of getting things going here. I apologize. Uh, let's start out with watching a brief video of a family having an advanced care planning conversation. And finally tonight, ABC News wants to join you in something right at the heart of the American family how we can all help the people who care about us make decisions near the end of our lives. And nine out of 10 of you have told us that we should all be talking about it at all ages, what we want, and yet only a fraction of us have done it. And we know it makes a huge difference in the health of the caregiver as well as those cared for. So ABC News has taken cameras inside a vital loving family, part of a new community deciding to have a conversation. This is 85-year-old Norb and his daughter, Maureen. My dad is 85 today. He's still very, very active. He's a wonderful friend. Throughout life, daughter and father have always talked about everything, except one thing, how to control the end of your life in the same way you control the prime of your life. So dad and daughter gather the family together, three generations, for an act of love. And so now we're just asking that you share some of your thoughts about what you would like at the end of your life um, so that we can honor your wishes. They are part of something new underway for families in America that says having the conversation is a gift parents and children give each other. And there's proof of the difference it makes. Studies show depression rates plummet after a loss if the families have had the conversation. Renowned physician Dr. Tobawande says doctors and nurses see it firsthand. When you're there in that moment and you're talking to the family and you're saying, how much will it bother your father if he ends up this way? And they say, more often than not, I don't know. We never talked about it. That, that it is incredibly traumatic for the family, for the doctors involved. There's often conflict. Um, it can tear families apart. So Dr. Gwande has become part of a team led by Pulitzer Prize winning writer Ellen Goodman. It is called The Conversation Project. It is a kind of guide for families looking for a way to begin. If we give them a way to talk about it and give people something to hang on to when they're afraid to start this conversation, they can do it and pass it on. Families like the Jenny. They looked over the conversation guide before they sat down together. First, there's laughter. Oh, my golf swing so good. <laughs> <laughs> and then dad directly eases his daughter's guilt and worry about having put their mother in hospice. I felt like that meant we were giving up on mom. She was in a lot of pain, and I thank God. I think it was handled really well. And next, Maureen asked. 
asks her dad for clarity on what he considers a good end to a great okay, life. So if you were in a condition where you couldn't make decisions for yourself, how, how extreme would you want us to take measures to save your life versus letting you go? Well, I, I, I think I'm ready to go anytime. You know, I wouldn't prolong anything. I mean, uh, I, I've lived a great life. Pretty lucky. And because of you guys, you know. Unexpectedly, a grandson inspired to speak up about his own wishes for his own life. That if there was no meaningful communication, that that I would want I would want you to to, to stop trying to intervene. We're not ready for you to go. Well, we're not ready for you to go. That's me neither. So <laughs> one by one, the others wait. Who are you? Happy birthday! And with that. Another family has joined a kind of estate planning for the heart. The conversation beginning in America. Now please tell us your stories in the days ahead about ways to begin the conversation with family members of all ages. Or if you don't want to have it, tell us about that too. Okay, so I know that we're going to have a discussion afterwards. I'm interested to see what your thoughts are on the video. I think what kind of hit home for me was it seemed like everything was kind of just wrapped up in that one conversation. And I know for me, it took four, really four or five conversations. So it's just an example, a little snapshot of what that can look like. So we've talked about advanced care planning. Let's talk about what an advanced directive is. An advanced directive is a legal document which a person specifies what actions should be taken if they're no longer able to make decisions for themselves due to a car accident, I mean, a car wreck or illness or whatever life altering event should happen. Um, basically, it's putting in writing exactly what decisions are made from these advanced care planning conversations. And there's some advantages to having an advanced directive. One is being able to express your wishes to your family, to your healthcare team, um, being able to lessen the, the uh, occurrence of disagreements between family members. I saw this play out a lot in hospice. So say a dad is on service and he says to his daughter, I don't want to be kept on life support. I don't want to be resuscitated. Just if I'm not able to, to live, I don't want to just exist. But he didn't tell his son. So then when it comes time, say he's on life support and his daughter says, okay, it's time to, to withdraw care. She's comfortable with it and she feels like she's confident in what he wants, but his son is not. And not having that conversation and, the, and the, the dad not talking to the son as well can cause a lot of problems. Um, also, what it does is it takes a lot of pressure and stress off the medical power of attorney, the person that's making decisions for you if you can't make them for yourselves. And, and another thing I've heard a lot from patients in hospice is that they don't wanna be a burden to their family members. As their disease process um, progresses and they need more care, but you know, sometimes we can be a burden to our loved ones after we've passed. If someone had to make a decision and they weren't sure that it's what you would have wanted, um, it can cause a lot of grief, a lot of second guessing, and so having an advanced directive in place just helps with that. And again, being able to express your wishes is important. So saying no, I'm so sorry y'all, saying no to certain medical interventions is not saying no to comfort care. So basically choosing to withdraw or not receive treatment 
does not mean that comfort care stops. Comfort care never stops. So that's an important point to know. You'll still receive comfort care even if you decide not to have a certain treatment or withdrawal treatment. So what did these three people have in common? Tom Petty, Joan Rivers, and David Bowie. Um, they all had advanced care planning conversations with their family members. Joan had a vocal cord surgery in September in 2014 and ended up uh, not regaining consciousness during the surgery. So she was put on a ventilator and her daughter, Melissa, who was her medical power of attorney, knew her wishes. Joan was, was very good about letting people know, not just her daughter, her friends. Um, I understand she let everyone know what her wishes were if she couldn't speak for herself. So a week after she became unconscious due to the surgery, she was taken off life support and she was 81 years old. Um, David Bowie passed January 10th, 2016 from cancer and he had just turned 69. Um, so as everyone was really surprised that he passed, it wasn't a shock to him and his friends and family because three months prior to his passing, when he was told he was no longer a candidate for treatment, he planned everything out. He produced a new record. He did a music video and was surrounded by family and friends when he passed. And his palliative physician said that of all patients that he had had, David carefully planned out every single thing more than anyone else he had had uh, do that. Tom Petty passed away in October 2017. He was at his home in Malibu and he collapsed. He was rushed to the hospital where he was immediately put on a ventilator. Well, then they discovered that he had a do not resuscitate form on him. Once they found that, they took him off life support and he was 66 years old. So Medicare drives all healthcare, right? And January 1st, 2016, they began reimbursing, reimbursing healthcare professionals for having advanced care planning conversations. It's based on how much time is spent. So for the first 30 minutes, it's billed under this one code, as you see, 99497. And then every 30 minutes after that has a different code. The point is, they are reimbursed for it. There's not a limit on how many conversations they can have with patients. Because let's say I go in and I bring the person that's going to be my medical power of attorney. We have several conversations. And then for whatever reason, that person is no longer my medical power of attorney. Well, then I've got to bring somebody else in. Not that you have to take somebody in, but basically those conversations can, can, you know, it, it takes a lot of them possibly. Um, any physician that's involved with care can bill for these, for these conversations as well. Okay, so this picture to the left is from a hospice in San Francisco. BJ Miller is a palliative physician who helped create the Zen Hospice Project. So what they would do is when someone passed at their hospice house and the gurney is being wheeled out through the garden, everyone stops, family members, visitors, staff, everyone comes out and just sprinkles rose petals uh, on the gurney, on the body. They share stories, they take a moment of silence. It's, it's respecting and honoring the person that has passed. And as you can see, the other photo is of a ICU hospital room where there's, like in here, the start floodlights, the, the machines beeping despite the person is passed. Um, it, staff is rushing around. It, it can seem like to an onlooker that there was no one even there. So it's, it's not a right or wrong, it's just thinking about those things as far as what you would want. 
hospitals were created for acute trauma and treatable illnesses. They weren't created for end of life care. So now some of you guys got packets, the ones that, that gave me their addresses. If you would like a packet after the presentation, just email me and I'll get you one out. And for those of you who have a packet, you have the Conversation Starter Kit booklet as well as the Healthcare Proxy booklet. Both of these booklets are from the Conversation Project from that video that we saw with Ellen Goodman. And it just kind of gives you, you know, some, some pointers on what do you want to talk about in the conversation? Where do you want to have it? Who do you want there? There was a participant at one of our presentations who said that he didn't want to look at his son. He didn't want to sit across from him. So they actually went to town late and just walked and talked. And they didn't look at each other, but both of them expressed what they wanted and they had a great conversation. And so there's no right way or wrong way or, you know, looking at that piece we saw, maybe it doesn't look like that for your family. So, so this booklet helps you kind of get, get a, thought of what you would want. And I, you know, some people pick it up and fill it out right away. Some people fill out part of it, set it down, come back later. I mean, you know, take as much time as you want. How to choose a healthcare proxy. So medical power of attorney is also referred to as healthcare proxy or healthcare agent. And we'll talk a little bit about that. This is a booklet that talks about when is the right time to choose your healthcare proxy. Well, when you turn 18, who should you choose to be your healthcare proxy? And so these booklets are within the packet and, and we're happy to get a packet out to you if you'd like that. Um, yes, if you email us, we can, we can get it to you through email. You don't have to wait to get it mailed. Um, so I'm not sure if any of you have completed your directives. I will tell you that at Hospice Austin, we did a survey three years ago when this grant started and less than half of us out of 250 employees, less than half of us had done our advanced directives. And this is pretty common. As you see on the screen, there was a nonprofit hospice in Florida with 900 employees, kind of the same results, less than half of them filled out their advanced directive. So it's not like if you have done it or haven't done it, it's not to make you feel bad. This is just to talk about, you know, what all this is. So next week, next Saturday, we're gonna go over the forms in detail, but I just wanted to kind of review what these forms are. So there's three different documents we talk about, the medical power of attorney, the directive to physicians, also called the living will, an out of hospital do not resuscitate form. And we'll just go over a little bit of information. So the medical power of attorney is that person that you have chosen or persons that you have chosen to make the healthcare decisions for you if you cannot do that for yourself. Now let's say it doesn't have to be a speaking, they have to speak, I mean, it doesn't mean that you have to speak for yourself. If let's say you can blink your eye once for yes or twice for no. I mean, it's, it's however you can communicate. If you can communicate for yourself, that person does not take over as your voice. And if there's a moment that, or time that you can speak for yourself, then you can't. And then you can again, they step back out. So they have access to your records. They can speak to physicians on your behalf. They can talk about the tests and treatments that can be done. So they're basically, again, your voice. And I wanna say the one important point in this is, you could build these documents out, but if that medical power of attorney states something different that's in the form, they're gonna go by their verbal. It's not going to be that Okay, you said that, but the form says this. So that's why it's important who you choose to be, to be your advocate. When is the right time? Again, anyone that's 18 years of age should start thinking and assign a medical power of attorney. 
Um, how often should you review it? I don't know, every decade, especially when there's you know major life events, marriage, divorce. We had a lady who was in a presentation and she got up in the middle and left. And I was like, oh my gosh, what happened? And her friend said, yeah, she's been divorced for two years and she hates her husband. So she's got to redo her forms. So, you know, whatever the situation is, it's important to address the forms and redo them if you need to, when there is a change in who's going to be the medical power of attorney, or if you've got things written down that you would like or not like in regards to your healthcare treatment and that changes, you might want to fill out a new form as well. Um, some important questions. So I think the biggest thing again is, is just understanding the gravity of that position to be able to speak on someone's behalf. They have got to know what your wishes are. And I saw this play out a couple of times where maybe a physician wants the patient to undergo a surgery or certain treatment, but the medical power of attorney knows that's not what the patient would have wanted. So, you know, they have to be able to stand their ground and speak on your behalf. It's, it can be a very stressful time, of course. So it's somebody that can handle situations that are highly stressful and can keep focus on what you would want. That's, that's the most important thing. This is a copy of a medical power of attorney form and it's in your packet. And again, next week we'll go over this form as well as the other two forms and detail and answer questions and so I just wanted to show you a little bit of what these forms look like. The directive to physicians, also called the living will, is it kicks in when you have an irreversible condition or terminal illness, so Alzheimer's, right? And usually filling this form out is between you and your physician or physicians. So they help you by telling you what will happen as the disease uh, progresses and you'll be able to know, okay, I want this, I don't want that. So that's what that form is, and this is what that form looks like. And it may be kind of hard to see. The out of hospital do not resuscitate order, okay? This is the only form that requires a doctor's order. And I'm gonna go ahead and click and show you what it looks like because it's so tiny and it's hard to read even when you have it in front of you. But the physician will sign twice, all witnesses sign twice, everyone signs twice basically. And a big problem with this form is they're not filled out correctly. Now this is what EMS looks for if they come out to the home, they're called out and someone says, okay, they don't want to be resuscitated. They're looking for that form and they've got to have that form. There is a backside to the form that simply just has the directions but in order for the form to be valid, it's got to have the front and back. Even if you fax it, you have to fax the back. So this is a copy of the form. This is a Texas form, but this is what Tom Petty had on him. It's probably a directive to physician as well. Um, on the back of your driver's license, you've got the opportunity to put emergency contact number. I know in Georgetown, I've I'm told that they're asking when people renew their license who their medical power of attorney is and putting that information on there, which is great. Now, when I went in and renewed my license, they didn't ask me anything about that. And I think in Travis County, I don't think that's very common, um, but know that, that you can put that on the back. So let's say there's a, a car accident and here comes the, the police on the scene they can look at your license plate, pull up all the information and see who to contact. Uh, we did a presentation in Taylor, Texas, and there were several police officers there and EMS. Now, I don't know if this is the same for Travis County, Williamson, other counties, but they said that if they pull up on a scene, the police officers cannot go through the car, go through somebody's purse and look for anything. They've got to wait for EMS. So this would be very helpful in that situation. Um, in your packet, 
you have organizing affairs and that is this little packet here and it, it doesn't just have uh, it, actually it's pretty thorough a lot of people charge for this we provide it free of charge on our website and you can go in and it's a PDF you can fill it out but it talks about or it, it has on here you can put your loans bank account information life insurance policies and what exactly you would want and it's all in one place so again I can send that to you electronically or get you a packet mailed out um, one last thing real fast is there is going to be a memorial that the bereavement department is having online Thursday, July 2nd at 7 p.m. And it's basically for those whose grief has been impacted by the pandemic. So I just wanted to let you know that. And Natalie, I'm ready for questions. Okay, um, <clears throat> I do not have any questions right now at this moment. Um, if you do have a question, um, please feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask it. If not, um, if you would like to um, submit any questions um, after the presentation, that please do so. You can email um, Shirley and, or, or myself. Um, and we will share that, let's see. So I have, um, could I have that website sent to me about how to organize your medical records? Absolutely, you can email me at s-p-r-i-c-e at hospice, h-o-s-p-i-c-e, austin.org, and I'll get that to you. And then- you the website. Mm -hmm. Do any, I have another question. Um, do any of the forms need to be notarized? Good question. So they can either be notarized or you can have two witnesses and it's preferred, it's preferred not to have anyone that could benefit from your passing or really any family members. It's better just, to, all they're doing is witnessing that you're signing. So you can get two witnesses. Um. Uh, it says, <clears throat> so you answered the notarized question. Um, someone's asking about in-laws. Um, do they count as family members? Um, I think it's okay, right, Brandy? Yeah. Um, I, it's just, if you just want to make sure that whoever is witnessing, um, like Shirley said, it does. it's better if it's not somebody that would um, benefit in any way, maybe financially. It's just better um, have them as witnesses or that they're not your medical power of attorney either. So in-laws are fine. Um, do you have any suggestions on how people can um, have witnesses um, sign these, doc these documents during um, COVID? That is a good question. And we've been thinking about that and kind of brainstorming about possibly setting up, probably on a weekend, setting up a table at our office on Spicewood Springs and having people make appointments. Like Natalie, you guys do your appointments for the lending. So you know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes a peak, you know, between appointments, and then we can help notarize. We'll probably get that set up, I would think, maybe within a month. Okay. I'll have more information next week about that. Okay, perfect. Um, I have another question. It says, on page nine in Organizing Affairs, it talks about power of attorney for four areas. Is it okay to have some person or should there be a different, different people, the same person? So is it okay to have the same person sign or should there be different people? Uh, they're talking about the power of attorney, not the medical part, right? Over assets. 
medical decisions having the same person. I'm sorry, Natalie, will you ask the question just one more time? Yeah. So it says, um, uh, it's on page nine of Organizing Affairs. Um, it talks about power of attorney for four areas. Mm -hmm. Is it okay to have the same person or should there be different? Oh, I would imagine so, yes. Um, yeah, it can definitely be the same person. Um, sometimes I think it might alleviate family members if you have somebody who maybe you trust more with your financial affairs and someone that you would trust more with medical decisions. But in some families, that is the, the same person. I know for my husband, he's the only child and only one involved. And so he's, he's everything. Um, but um, yeah. Um, next question. Um, for those of us who have large families, um, what are uh, what are some ways to communicate um, with them without with with siblings or other family members without um, getting all their rage? Um, how's what is the best way to, to to go about this type of conversation with with a big family? That's a good question because each family is different, right? And it may be several conversations. Um, Brandy, what thoughts do you have on that? I, the first thing that came to mind that I've seen work well is, is maybe you have an individual conversation with somebody who you know would be your, um, would be somebody that would be in line with your medical wishes and then involve them in the conversation with the larger family. Um, I think, uh, like Shirley said, it's, it may be several conversations that you're having with different um, groups, but I think like using these tools and being able to fill out what you want prior to um, helps make sure that those conversations are consistent. Um, I would say too, the person, it, it's important for whatever wishes that person has for them to express that to each of the family members. Because again, I've seen that go really wrong um a lot of times so if if it's say my dad he needs to tell all of us himself what he wants so it's coming straight from him and there's not problems later i think that's the biggest thing is is being able to express your wishes to each family member um what you would want does that does that help? Do you have more questions on that? Um, I think I think you I think you you answered that well. Um, I think having the person who wants or needs to communicate their wishes um, be the one to at least start that conversation, lead it um, with support. I, you know, again, you know, every family is different. Um, so yeah, if you, uh, to the person who answered, who asked that question, if you would like to reach out to me or Shirley privately, yeah. we'd, we'd be happy to, to talk a little bit more about that in depth. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah, that's important. Y'all can reach out to us, me or Brandy. And I think the other thing that you could utilize, you know, Shirley touched on that your physicians are involved in this, can be involved in these conversations as well. And sometimes it's helpful to have that physician's input. And so maybe you bring along with you somebody who who you feel is is like i said going to be sort of your you know will be a good advocate for you and, and honor your wishes later in life and so having them have that conversation with you and your physician i think might be helpful um, in guiding the conversation that's good brandy i have another question <clears throat> it says i'm curious about horror stories when no one is actually Oh, no, when no one has actually taken the time to get these documents in order, especially in the case of someone who is an only child and no decisions have been made, would someone just be put on life support indefinitely in some cases by the hospital treating? If, um, you know, uh, I, 
Yeah, I, so I don't believe that there would be a situation where someone would be on life support indefinitely. Our hospital systems are set up very well. And now they do, you know, they're trying to make sure that they have honored the person's wishes and they've talked to family members or talked to loved ones or anybody involved in care. Um, but there are ethics committees that occur at at hospitals and and they're they're pretty good advocates for what the person would want um, or or what what is in the best interest really at that time but they they're going to they really want to exhaust all options before the hospital staff has to make any any decisions um, so that means trying to find anybody who might be involved in that person's life I mean we've seen you know, friends that have be, had to become decision makers or, um, you know, it, it's estranged family members that are out of state that they're trying to reach out to to get an idea of what that person would want. And so that, that's what makes this all the more important is having the, um, is having this in some place where somebody knows how to access what your wishes are. Your doctor's office can also keep record of what your wishes are. So just knowing who your, people knowing who your doctor is um, can help support them at that time and being able to find the documents. Um, so you can keep them on record there. Um, with hospice care, you know, we keep them on record for all of our patients. So the hospice team helps with um, making decisions um, if, if there's a, a need for that. But, the person who you've designated or the family member is who the medical team is looking to first. Does that answer the question? Yeah, and if you don't have, so you don't have an advanced directive, it's the, it goes to spouse. If you don't have a spouse, it goes to adult children. Then it goes to siblings, no, parents, then siblings, right? Right. Right, and then nearest relative. But I mean, this is why I was so panicked. I'm single, I live alone. I'm like, oh my God, no one's gonna find me. My dogs are gonna be laying on top of me. I don't know what could happen. So uh, that is a really good point. But again, thank you for talking about the ethics committee because there, there will be a decision made at some point. Hi, uh, may I make a comment here? Sure. Um, yeah, um, I think uh, one other thing uh, that we just uh, want folks to know that on the medical power of attorney form, there is a place to name a backup or alternate agent. So that can be helpful too, um, just in case the first person you name to speak for you is in that car wreck with you. <laughs> or I don't know, maybe they're on a cruise ship and uh, they, it's hard to um, get in touch with them. It's very useful to have a second person uh, to whom the healthcare providers can turn uh, for answers. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. That's, that is true and, and we're gonna go over the forms in great detail next weekend. But if y'all have questions in between then, you can call me or reach out or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're happy to answer that too. Or if you would like extra packets, um, yeah. maybe have one for notes and then one to actually like fill out, um, we can also get that back out to you all. Um, I, let's see. Um, so here's another really great question. Um, so what if, what if you're out of the country on a trip? How do you, um, the advanced directives kick in? Um, do you carry them with you if you're traveling? Um, I think this also brings up a really great question in terms of um, accessibility and having copies and um, having a, a, you know, maybe having your documents saved on a thumb drive or um, how would you, what, what happens in that case of um, you're out on a trip? Um, how should somebody go about that, having that information accessible? 
Well, it's definitely important to take your documents with you. Another thing that's important that brings up, when you get these documents filled out, give them to all physicians involved in your care. If you've been a patient at Seton or St. David's and they have a record on you, then you might wanna go up there and give them a copy of your directives. Each family member should have a copy. Brandy, what do you think as far as if you're out of the country and something happens? I mean, the intent behind the directives, um, you know, the, the DNR is specific to Texas. Um, the, but having like the, all of the directives filled out, the medical power of attorney and especially the living will directed to physician, then, then that's showing what your intention is. Um, and so I think a medical professional, they try to honor the intention. So um, yeah, I think it's important to carry the documents with you as best you can. Mm -hmm. so. I'll tell you, we this is our third year of the grant and we had a presentation, I think it was a year ago to a lot of healthcare professionals. And there was a lady there, a nurse, two weeks after the presentation, she reached out to me and asked if um, myself and one or two of the nurses could come to the hospital to help her with her forms. It seems that she borrowed her daughter's car for the day and was south on Manchac. Was it Manchac? Um, and the car ran out of gas, she's on the side of the road, and she's trying to put gas in her car and she gets hit. The first car that went by happened to see her, got in a different lane and missed her, right? And then the, evidently the, there was a kind of a dip in the road and the next vehicle, and it was a pickup, hit her and pinned her against her car. So when he, you know, pulled the vehicle back, she fell over, had a brain bleed, went to the hospital, and her daughter comes to the hospital, is frantic. I think they were unsure if they were going to be able to save her leg at that point. Her, the, the whole thing of this is she said, you know what, I realized first off I need to have these forms, but second off, my daughter's not the one to be my medical power of attorney. I saw that in action. And most of us probably won't get that opportunity to test drive the medical power of attorney, but she knew at that point, look, you know, she's not gonna be able to handle it. So that's been a pretty powerful story that kind of has stuck with me. <clears throat> um, thank you. I, I have another question. Um, when it comes to the um, the do not resuscitate form, um, if you, let's say you're shopping at a, a grocery store or um, out at a park um, and, and something happens and EMS is called, um, you, and if you have that form, um, and it's it's not accessible. Um, it's not you're not on. It's not on you. You're jogging. Um, will EMS automatically resuscitate? Yeah, their license is on the line as well. And so, if you, I'm sorry. And if you do have it, let's say you do have that form and you have it on you out somewhere, um, will they not if it's brought to their attention? Right. If that's in place, then they, they will not. And they do have bracelets mm -hmm. that you can get, um, I think through the Texas Department of Health and Human Services, you can get a bracelet that you've got on and it's, it's I mean, it's a physician order to have that do not resuscitate form. So you've got to get that to them and they'll get you a bracelet. It's not like you can get a Lance Armstrong bracelet and stick it on and you know it's it's a it's a legit deal to have. That might help. Um, can I add something to that? Absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, on the state's page, which has the out of hospital do not resuscitate form, you know, that you can click on it, open the form and print a copy. Uh, further down on the page, they have a list of approved vendors from whom you can obtain either a bracelet or a pendant. And um, in order to get one of these, you have to submit to that vendor a copy of your properly executed uh, document, and then they will send you, um, again, either a bracelet or a pendant. I think those, the ones that the uh, Medical Association supplies are like, just like those bands that they put on you in the hospital, kind of that skinny uh, white plastic thing. But um, these pendants and bracelets that you can purchase um, are made of metal. Thank you so much for that. I will, um, there have been some really great comments and I am gathering the, the information that's been provided by you all. And I will um, also send that out in an email along with the, uh, the recording. Um, thank you, so thank you for that input. So I have another question and well, this will be the last one so we can wrap up. Um, we, I have, uh, if you have the vial of life registered with EMS and EMS arrives at your home, will they look up your directives? Um, well, and I'm not quite sure about that. If you'll email me, I'll get back with you on that. But I will tell you, you have to keep in mind that the time that's involved in this, there's not a whole lot of time when someone is needing help that they can stop and look at this or look at that. It's, you know, have your, your DNR form on your fridge, you know, or up in your house somewhere. They don't have a lot of time. They're going to err on basically what's in the best interest of their licensure and trying to help as well. So, I mean. Oh, and one more question related to that, I'm sorry, um, is, uh, well, you, and we may have already answered this, um, will EMS look up directives um, if they're, if this person is registered with them to have a vial of life? Uh, and we can, I can actually reach out to my EMS contact as well um, and, and get that Yeah. Answered. We will find out that answer. Um, okay, so thank you all for, for spending your, your morning with us. Um, I hope you are all able to come back next week. Um, it'll be Saturday, um, same time, 10 a.m. Um, and uh, hospice office will go over all of the forms. Um, again, we will answer questions if you have submitted any questions that I have not got, gotten to, then um, we will absolutely address that offline. And I have lots of notes and in, in some, um, some information to report back next week as well. Um, again, uh, next week will be with the forms. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me, Natalie um, or, or Shirley, and I will Again, send our information out via email. Um, and, I, and that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Natalie. Thank, Thank you. you all.